from CGTN headquarters in Beijing. This is The Hub with Wang Guan. Hello and welcome to The Hub. I'm Wang Guan in Beijing. The refugee crisis in Ukraine is spinning out of control as civilians flee combat zones in fear for their lives. Neighboring countries are doing their share, but the sheer size of the crisis calls for an urgent international response. The U.S. pledged to take in 100,000 refugees. What to make of such a charitable gesture? To discuss all this in New York, I'm joined by Dr. Simon Adams. He's the president and CEO of the Center for Victims of Torture. Dr. Adams, thank you for joining us at this hour. You raised the alarm in an article published last Friday saying that the global refugee crisis is getting out of hand. Now with the Russia-Ukraine conflict dragging on, Europe is now at the epicenter of this all. What is most striking about the current crisis? No, first of all, thank you for having me on the show. It's a pleasure to be here. And I think that is true. I think the refugee crisis that's been called by Russia's illegal invasion of Ukraine has, is now radiating across Europe. You know, we've seen Poland welcome in something like over 3 million refugees, Romania, Moldavia, uh, Slovakia. I think in a couple of hours, uh, something like 25,000 people, even in the UK, offered up their homes to Ukrainian refugees. And, and that's fantastic. I think that should be applauded, the empathy that people are showing to refugees. But we are at a time when we have historic levels of displacement caused by persecution, by conflict and atrocities. Over 82 million people around the world, from Syria you know, to Cameroon, Venezuela, and of course, to Ukraine. So I'd love to see that empathy expanded to other frontiers, to other people. You know, we need to kind of end this globalization of indifference that's taken place over the last couple of years. And we need to respond to all these refugee crises with a similar level of compassion and empathy. So Dr. Adams, you mentioned the globalization of indifference. Can you elaborate? Do you think there's a double standard somehow? I mean, when it comes to the treatment of uh, European refugees versus refugees in Africa and the Middle East, for example. Yeah, and I should, I should say, by the way, that was the Pope's term. I borrowed that term from him. I want to make sure that I give credit. But he was speaking to, I think, something that's a real problem in the world at the moment, is we do sometimes see that there's a kind of a hierarchy of, of suffering. I think it's very sad that we've had so many reports even when we see this tremendous and positive response in some European countries, African exchange students who are studying in Ukraine being pushed back from the border, other people being treated with racist hostility. And I think over the last couple of years, we've seen in so many places of, uh, in the world, this kind of toxic politics of rising xenophobia directed particularly against refugees turning up in other people's countries, whether they be Syrians, Afghans, or wherever they are. And I think that's a, that's a very, very sad thing. So I think that rather than kind of point out the negative here of the double standard, what I would prefer to do is to say that the very basic human compassion being shown by people towards Ukrainians is something we should celebrate. But we should say Ukrainians are not the only people facing war, not the only people pay, facing persecution, atrocities, and suffering at the moment. And we need to export that compassion to other groups of people as well. Right. Sir, uh, refugees have to go through a terrible ordeal. We all know that. Uh, fleeing their homes is just the tip of the iceberg. They need protection from uh, petty hum humiliation and overt exploitation, to name just a few. How do you think we can ensure that their basic human rights are protected? I think this is a very important question. I think in too many parts of the world, we see that the world's most vulnerable populations, people who are fleeing war, who are fleeing conflict, end up becoming prey for human traffickers or, or for sex traffickers even. And I think that's a very sad thing. But I think there are many organizations in the world, credible NGOs who do work with refugees, you know, my own organization included. There are also UN agencies. And so again, I think what we need at this time of unprecedented kind of historic levels of displacement, highest levels since the Second World War, it has to be said. What we need is more states to get behind that international humanitarian system and make sure that we're able to cope with this flow of, of human beings who are fleeing.
President Joe Biden of the United States said last Thursday that the U.S. would accept up to 100,000 refugees from Ukraine. The U.S. will provide $1 billion in new funding. Um, some say this is too little, too late. What do you think? I think it's a very important gesture, and I think it, it, it sends a signal, the right kind of signal, that this is not just Poland's problem or not just a Ukrainian issue. It, it shows that there needs to be a global response to the Ukrainian situation. I also, and I wrote about this in the article that you mentioned before very kindly, you know, I wrote about this also, though, exposing some of the weaknesses in the U.S. system. I think this should be an opportunity for President Biden to kind of repair and rebuild the U.S. system around refugee resettlement and around asylum seekers. You know, some commentators, including those uh, writing op-ed for New York Times, said that President Joe Biden was um, bowing to domestic inter international pressure to accept Ukraine's refugees. Is there some truth to this statement? I do think there's some truth to that statement, but I don't think that's necessarily a bad thing. I'd rather have public sentiment saying we need to be more compassionate. We need to do something to help people who are being, whose lives have been essentially upended and destroyed by war rather than the reverse. And I think, you know, when you look around the world at the moment, you know, I've spoken several times about this massive displacement crisis. So many of the countries who are bearing the burden, who are bearing the weight of that crisis, are countries like Jordan uh, or, or like Turkey, countries that maybe aren't as wealthy, as strong, or as powerful as some major European nations or as the United States of America. So I think we need better burden sharing to make sure that we can deal with this crisis. Right. The U.S. has long been a safe haven for refugees, uh, most notably welcoming tens of thousands of Jews, if not more, uh, fleeing Russia and Eastern Europe uh, in the, at the turn of the 20th century, and also you know, their programs to welcome refugees from Asia during the height of the Cold War, uh, namely from Vietnam, among other countries. What's different this time around? Yeah, I mean, I, I think that there's an obvious thing, and I think it's very easy sometimes, you know, particularly for Europeans or people of European descent to look at what's going on in Ukraine and they see people who might look like them. And so they identify and maybe it's easier for them to, to empathize. But my experience, you know, working with refugees and asylum seekers and visiting places, for example, in the United States and around the world that deal with refugee populations, I think there is a general human sympathy for other human beings, regardless of the color of their skin or, or their religion. Um, so I think we really need to, uh, to see more of that. Sure, sure. The U.S. alone or with its allies have invaded or bombed countless countries in the past 30 years. It is no secret. Uh, the U.S. is also supporting and financing military operations in many hot spots of the world. Uh, tens of millions of people have been affected in Iraq, Serbia. Let's not forget Serbia, right? Afghanistan, Syria, Libya, the list goes on. Um, are we witnessing a change in attitude somehow, uh, given the fact that these round of refugee crises are those originating from Europe? I don't think it's a new era in that sense. I mean, I don't think there's any permanent member of the UN Security Council that has completely clean hands when it comes to, to any of these issues. But I think, you know, this invasion um, of, of, of Ukraine has obviously been a real challenge to the international um, system. And so I think that has caused people to think about what is, are we living in a new era? Are we living in a new Cold War? I don't necessarily agree with that language, but I think it's certainly time for all nations of the world, including very powerful nations like China and the United States and others, to stand firmly and squarely behind international law and behind the idea that big nations, regardless of who they are, whether it be Russia, the United States, or anybody else, can't simply invade their neighbors because they don't like the politics of that government there. Also, finally, the global refugee crisis is not going to disappear overnight. Uh, you wrote that uh, there are currently 84 million people displaced by conflict, persecution, and atrocities. The office of the UNHCR experts uh, expects this figure to reach 100 million. Is the world prepared for a crisis of such magnitude? I don't think it is. And I think that's what we're seeing now with the kind of desperate measures 
because again, the Ukrainian situation is just the tip of the iceberg. It's going to take uh, a massive effort by, I think, all the leading states of the United Nations and others to actually get behind trying to solve this international humanitarian catastrophe. You are the president and CEO of the Center for Victims of Torture. You have been uh, working on helping those refugees over the past years and decades. Um, what are the practical challenges during your line of work? Well, I think there's many challenges, not least of all denialism of, of some governments that, that torture is a problem either in their own countries or in other people's countries. And certainly what we find at the moment with our work and my own organization, as you, as you said, works in a number of countries, works with refugees, works with asylum seekers. I think the biggest problem we face at the moment is capacity. There is simply, unfortunately, far more demand for our services than there is a capacity for us to provide it even though we're treating about 20,000 survivors of torture every year. And I think that's a very sad indictment of the world that we live in, that we, we simply cannot meet the demand from, from survivors for the kinds of counseling and support that my organization provides. Yeah, hopefully uh, all those you need will be helped eventually. Uh, Dr. Simon Adams, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. You're watching The Hub. Stay tuned for a panel discussion on the economic fallout of the Russia-Ukraine conflict coming up after a short break. Welcome back. The conflict in Ukraine enters its second month and Moscow has already been the target of harsh and wide-ranging sanctions. Russian exports are severely curtailed and the ruble plunged after Russia was cut off from SWIFT. Europe is, however, feeling the pinch too with volatile oil and gas prices while ramping up its defense spending. It now looks like Russia is giving Europe a taste of its own medicine with dramatic consequences for the global commodity markets and the world economy. Can this looming energy crisis be prevented? And are we in for the long haul? To answer some of these questions, we're joined now by Liu Xia, founder and CEO of Cloud Hands Trading. And also here in Beijing is current affairs commentator Einar Tangen. Welcome to both of you to The Hub on CGTN. Uh, Lucia, let me go to you first. One month into the conflict, what do you see as the biggest economic fallout from the Russia-Ukraine conflict? Morning, everyone. Uh, actually, before the war, we've seen the um, global economy has been in a difficult situation already, um, like the high inflation, the flyer of the energy crisis, and the tighter food supply. And after the war, um, the U.S. and EU has put in some uh, pressures, um, for example, the sanctions um, on Russian um, to crippling the Russian economy. And also, I think uh, the price is not only paid by the Russian and um, also by U.S., EU and our countries. So uh, the cost is, for example, the worsen of the global supply chain uh, from the uh, high tech um, some raw important materials to um, transportation and energy market. So um, as China is a big player in the global market, China has been affected by all this um, negatively. But at the same time, I see there is a chance of China playing a different role in the global payment system and in the role of the um, new global economy. So um, for example, Russia has been the dollarizing for years. And um, after the SWIFT um, sanctions, dollar um, is um, not the uh, first choice by Russian. So I've seen um, Saudi Arabian is considering using yuan to pay oil. So I've seen there's a good side and a bad side to China. All right, Einar, what do you see, what do you identify as the biggest economic fallout that no one wants to see from this crisis in Ukraine? Well, I mean, uh, unlike the uh you know, what happened with the financial meltdown. What you have today is, you know, people lost their homes, they lost their savings. In today's environment, they're talking about food and energy. You cannot live without food and you cannot run a country or an economy without energy. So at this time, I mean, you're, you're looking at existential threats to uh, countries, not only uh, Ukraine, but if you look around the world, all the developing worlds are loaded with debt. They were never uh, given enough vaccines. Um, they just don't have anything. And these higher prices are going to push them over the top. It's not just about higher prices. There are actual shortages, and we all know who's going to pay in the end when that happens. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, the, the downstream industries, the consumers, 
uh, everyone, you know, uh, cannot, uh, no one can escape from this crisis. Um, so, Lucia, let me go back to you. If the war drags on for another month or months, how bad will global economy suffer? And in particular, how do you foresee the Chinese economy to be impacted? Mm -hmm. Uh, this week, actually, we see a bounce in the market after there are some good rumors about the market comes out, saying the Russian is um, reducing radically about their um, some of the actions and also some good news from the Ukraine side. The market takes these rumors as, as a good news. So I think that in the short term, the sentiment is a little bit settled down compared to in the um, previous weeks. But in the medium term, I think um, no real good news comes out. Right, right, because we did see that global markets rebounded. Some markets even rallied on the news of a potential breakthrough uh, yes. on the side of the negotiations, right? So uh, is it safe to say that what will happen to global markets depend largely on the progress of number one, the, the war situation on the battlefield, and number two, on the negotiating table? Mm -hmm. um, I think um, what happened now is like um, uh, just a short-term bond. I, I don't see um, the market funds is ground or have a V-shape um, rebound in the stock market. So I think now it's more like people have been so tired about the, all the news, negative news coming, coming out and traders take it as a, a buying the rumor, selling the truth. So when the um, real news coming out, people will be considering the medium term and longer term effect afterwards. So that might not be a real good news to the market. Hmm. Einar, what do you think? Well, I mean, for, for China, there's a lot of things. First off, uh, people should know that China has some of the largest uh, reserves of food out there in terms of wheat, corn, etc. I mean, literally, over 50% of the uh, available wheat reserves are in China. China was pre uh, preparing not for this occasion, but they saw that there was food was going to be uh, an issue yeah. uh, coming out of the pandemic, and they have been wisely uh, stockpiling. So it's not going to hit China as hard, but there are, is going to be this kind of letdown in global demand. I mean, you, you, you cannot have these kind of consequences. And it could get worse, especially in the commodities areas, if, if in fact, the Ukrainians are not able to harvest their winter wheat crop. And then after that, if they're not able to uh, plant in the spring planting season. This removes all of what they've done. Now, this is not just about wheat and corn. Edible oils, sunflower oil, over 50% comes uh, from Ukraine and Russia. So you're really looking at a whole bunch of shortages, not only there, but steel, automotive parts. This is going to really dig deep into uh, everybody, including especially Europe. So at this time, uh, everyone's kind of looking at how long this is going to go. And unfortunately, the negotiation table does not look good. I mean, you see some progress, but not enough. Yeah, we know that a lot of countries are commodities importing countries, right? So they, their economy and the, the livelihood of their residents depend largely on uh, the, the capacity, the capability of Russia and Ukraine to export wheat, for example, among other commodities. And the World Bank even predicted that if the war drags on, many countries and the residents in many countries can fall back into poverty. Well, look at a place like Egypt. Sixty uh, bread is a staple, and it's at every single meal. Sixty percent of the wheat comes uh, from Russia. Uh, the issue there is that Russia can to continue to supply wheat, uh, but it's going to cost more. And quite frankly, there's a question of how it's paid, because although Egypt is not joining in on the sanctions list, the U.S. has uh, signaled that it will go after anybody in any country that uh, violates what it thinks are uh, its unilateral rules for the, uh, the world economy, economy. Okay, Lisa, let me go back to you. The OPEC Plus meetings will take place on Thursday. Do you think the ministers will somehow decide to raise output? And if so, by how much? Mm -hmm. Yeah, everyone has been watching really closely to this meeting. After the um, yeah, Russian invasion on, of Ukraine, uh, U.S. and EU has been putting pressures um, repetitively urge OPEC to rise uh, oil production. But over the past weeks, I don't think they, they have the attitude to do so. And in this meeting, I don't expect any news to coming out um, saying they want to um, rise oil production. And actually, in the energy market, um, it's formed by big players. And now, um, 
EU and US are taking actions to reduce their reliance on Russian energy and Russian oils. So I think um, the, the uh, new pressures in the energy market will depend on how uh, soon or how much EU can cut their reliance on Russian energy rather um, um, expecting some news from the OPEC. So I think in the end, um, we, are, um, we want to see the um, energy prices settle down, coming down, but it all depends on how the big players um, place in this energy battlefield. So, Anir, what are you watching for for this OPEC Plus meeting? Well, I'm less concerned about oil. I mean, oil is somewhat fungible. If the oil isn't flowing uh, to Europe, it's going to flow to the east, to the, to the countries that uh, do not have sanctions. But gas is another thing. You cannot switch it on and off. I mean, you need specialized uh, facilities to liquefy it down to negative 165 degrees, uh, centigrade. Then you have to ship it at the same temperature, and then you have to have a receiving station. All that costs billions of dollars. Each one of these uh, tankers, and they figure they need about 80 of them, would cost $500 million. All right? That does not include the facilities for liquefying and also receiving. You're talking about uh, you know, a lot of money, getting towards a trillion dollars uh, to get all of this uh, stuff rerouted. So that, and th that's going to take years to happen. So at this juncture, it's less about oil, except as oil as a substitute. You cannot convert. Uh, gas turbines to oil burners very easily, and it'll take months or even years, and it's very expensive. You know, the Europe, the EU, has been saying that it wants to cut off its reliance on the Russian energy. The EU imported, uh, here are some figures, 40% of its natural gas from Russia, and about a quarter of European oil and petroleum products came from Russia before the war in Ukraine. Do you think somehow the U.S. can uh, fill in the vacuum as Washington promised? No. <laughs> Frankly, I mean, it's impossible. I mean, to, as I said, on the gas end of it, uh, you, you're talking about three or four years minimum. And right now, all the shipyards are full. If you're talking about oil, the U.S. cannot ramp up production enough to satisfy what uh, Europe needs. So this is a situation where, uh, you know, you hear all these pronouncements, Europe and the U.S. talking about how to get off reliance. The fact is you can't flip a switch and turn off 30% of your total energy production and switch it to somewhere else. There's not enough capacity. Well, about Lucia, given the energy crisis, the geopolitics, um, and also potentially an energy shortage, are you seeing a transition in Europe or other parts of the world? Um, perhaps they're thinking to uh, fast, fasten the process of transitioning off fossil fuel and into renewable energy? Um, the coal and traditional energies um, have been um, much more reliant on Russian. Um, so it's very hard for them to transit to the renewable energy in the short term. And also we see the transition um, caused some problems last year, um, which caused the energy prices growing so much up in the short, short term. Um, so I think um, it can't be done in the short term. I'm saying within one or two years. All right, Einar, let's talk about the supply chains. Russia is not a huge economy, but it's still pretty much relevant, uh, however you look at it. How do you think the conflict has impacted the global supply chains, which, which was already strained uh, because of COVID? I've talked to people in the shipping industry, and uh, prices are just going up and will continue to go up. Just remember that if you're not importing your wheat from Russia, that means you're probably going to get it from the United States or Brazil. That means that you need ocean-going um, you know, haulers to do that, and those are already filled. So you're looking at a, an acute shipping uh, supply deficit at a time when you have essentials. These aren't things you can say, well, it's you know, watches. I don't need another um, you know, Apple watch. This is something where you actually need food. So this, this is becoming a critical issue, which has been largely ignored by the U.S. and the E.U. as they struggle to take care of themselves. But they're basically throwing everyone else, especially developing countries, into the water. Yeah, especially if you think about uh, the prospect of a potential uh, Cold War after the hot war in Ukraine. You know, the financial sanctions, counter sanctions, uh, the trade barriers, uh, you know, non-tariff barriers between NATO and Russia, things can get a lot worse. Well, they can. You know, what's interesting about this is you have the two richest areas, uh, you know, Europe and America, apart from, you know, Korea and Japan. 
and they're going to use a, a substantial amount of their wealth, uh, basically closing their doors. Remember, if you produce something in the U.S. and it costs you $15 an hour to uh, have an employee versus 50 cents an hour in other places like Bangladesh, all right, there's just no way that you can compete. Uh, you cannot sell your products overseas and the overseas products are prevented from coming in. So your consumers pay more and you become less uh, competitive. So this is going to be a kind of downward spiral for both the U.S. and Europe if they continue this kind of Cold War uh, mentality on the economic front. For sure, for sure. Lu Xia, how do you look at the challenges facing global supply chains? Uh, after the war, or the war breaks out, I see the um, for example, um, the wars in, in the global supply chain in some high-tech products, um, important raw materials, and I think it will last longer than we expected. Even after um, the, the war, as you said, the globalization might have end. And we, um, we are looking for um, some potential opportunities to have a new globalization, which might lead by China and lead by some digital economies. So um, this gives us a new chance to find our new role in the supply chain, in the global economy. Yeah, that was you know, really leading up to my next question because many policy experts predict a dual Cold War situation, uh, like Heiner mm -hmm. and I have been talking about after the Ukraine crisis. There can be a Cold War between NATO and Russia and also the, the one launched by the U.S. against China. Uh, do you think all this may end globalization as we know it? Um, I think now we are entering a new phase of globalization, which is leading by the digital economy. And also China is playing a different role in this new um, globalization. Um, so I'm, um, I'm, I'm looking at the, um, the, the um, disruptions in the um, global supply chain caused by the war and also the new chances coming out. For example, um, we are building some of the threats in the high tech uh, field and also we are driving some changes in the internet industry. So I see maybe a new globalization is shaping after this war. Einer, uh, what do you think? I mean, uh, are we going to see uh, a different version of globalization? Not a different one. What you see is the decline of globalization and the rise of regionalization. I mean, you start looking at the RCEP, the Belt and Road, the TCTPP. Uh, these are all uh, efforts to try to deal with the, uh, you know, the, the downfall of WTO because the U.S. will not allow any um, appellate judges to be appointed. So uh, countries are going to band together. I'm, I'm a little bit more helpful. I think we're on the point of crisis. And at that point, uh, countries are going to have to come together or face dire consequences and create a better world order. Otherwise, there's going to be real problems. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, at the end of the day, it's consumers and uh, average ordinary citizens who are feeling the pinch. Uh, thank you very much, Liu Xia, and thank you, Einer. Thank you both very much for joining us at this hour. And they will do it for this edition of The Hub on CGTN. What you think matters? Send us a message on Weibo, Douyin, or other social media platforms. Thank you for joining us. I'm Wang Wen. Our news coverage continues. Bye and take care.